Okay, so here we are. This is one of our first forays into the podcast world, the Biblos Network. It's been a dream for a long time to be able to communicate with the greater world of faith. And after a few efforts to do that, this, I believe, is going to be one that is going to be sustainable and it's going to be able to talk and get into some some pretty cool topics. And there's nobody I'd rather do that with than my friend, Pastor Caleb Adams from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, we've been friends for a long time, and we've seen a lot of stuff, built things, worked together in the country, out of the country, um, done some crazy stuff Yeah, uh, that we'll talk a little bit about later on. A lot of fun with some of our other brethren. But man, welcome. I'm glad, glad you could pop in today. Well, Pastor Urshan, it's so good to uh, be here with you here in Durham and I'm so excited about uh, you being here and the work of God and the good people of God here in Durham. I know the future is going to be very bright. Yeah. Yeah, it's a little surreal because you, Pastor, in northeast Memphis. Yes. Right on I-40, right? Yeah, I-40 in the Bartlett area. Yeah, that's a beautiful area. Yeah, I love it. God's country. <laughs> the promised land. Yeah. I think that's what you call it. <laughs> that's right. Right there in the middle of the promised land. Yeah. Well, I, okay. So what's strange that folks may not know is that I was on the south side of Memphis Metro over the state line in Mississippi, but a suburb of Memphis, South Haven, Mississippi. And for a good while there, we thought we were going to be tackling Memphis together. Yeah. And then you up and left us. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, and I spoiled everything, didn't I? We, we got to slug it out with the yeah. east of Memphis uh, That's right. by ourselves now. Well, and then to that, you know, you've got Pastor Julio May up there in the central area, and then your brother took my spot, Tim Adams, Pastor Tim Adams there, and he's doing a great job in South Carolina. Yeah, LA. he really is. It was surreal. So you, you were one of my closest friends and pastored across town, and, and uh, totally unbeknownst to me when, the transition to Durham came up all of a sudden. Uh, you felt to ask my brother Tim to come and uh, follow you and be your successor there in South Haven. And it's really like a dream come true. So I lost a great friend, but I gained a brother up close. And so yeah. it's 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 been all good. Yeah, and so now we're in the digital world now that I don't think anybody has fully explored all the potential of it. Um, but here, because of podcasting ability and broadcasting and streaming ability. We're able to collaborate on a lot of stuff. Right. Do a lot of stuff. Um, so in Memphis, it you took over in Fraser, the Fraser area. Yes. And you built the church. God blessed you. And I mean, people are coming to church like left and right in Fraser. Great, great revival, great growth. You outgrew your facility. You were really right. constrained there for, yeah, for quite some time. Yeah, when we took the church, uh, it was uh, rather small. I think there were thirty-three members when we came in two thousand five, and uh, shortly after the transition, thirteen of those uh, left, and then and that's how that works. Isn't just it? a little bit later, a few more died, and so it was uh, pretty slim. I often remind the church that. On a typical Sunday morning, you could drive a Mack truck right down to the middle of the sanctuary and not hit a single soul. Yeah. And so that's where we were. The, the, uh, the area was very, um, a very depressed uh, area, a lot of poverty. A lot of crime. A lot of crime. Which is a challenge. Crime. That's a challenge for a church because yeah. when folks come to church. It's huge. Yeah, they don't want to be afraid they're going to get mugged or something like that. Right. And people were afraid and it was a legitimate fear, too. <laughs> They had good reason, didn't they? But we jumped in there, and that's what we had to work with. And God helped us and gave us revival, and so we grew in spite of it. I believe you can build a church right at the doorstep of hell. Yeah. If God puts you there, it doesn't matter where you're at. You can build it and grow. That's interesting. You know, Fort Myers was like that. Fort Myers Is that was, right? Yeah, our location uh, before Pastor Williams uh, took it, and um, he's done a great job following us there as well. Before that, though, it was a tough area, uh, a lot of crime, a lot of, a lot of dynamics there. Yeah, and similar, very similar. People were afraid, they were concerned, they they were they were worried about some things, and they there were some folks that said you can't build a church there. You, Is you, that right? Yeah, you can't do it. Um, and they kind of were a little disparaging about it, I guess. 
Yeah, well, you, you proved them wrong, and Pastor Williams is continuing to prove them wrong. He is. He is. So uh, the point being, you can't stop a God-called person. That's right. Even in challenging circumstances. That's so right. now, so you're on the east side, you're right there on the highway. When you drive by, I've driven it by, by it many times, and you have a beautiful facility on the north side of the highway, and two things would occur when I would drive by. First thing was, thank God for what he's provided, the vision, the, the, pro, the provision, the, the kind of a mindset that says we can do it, and then God does it through you guys. Yes. And then the second thing was just a little pang of jealousy, watching you just blow up and just blast off to the moon. That was it was yeah, awesome. Uh, how funny. <laughs> it was good, man. It's awesome to watch it happen. So you guys are off to the races. It's yeah, we're off to the races. So we moved into our new building on the first Sunday of 2019, and uh, so now we're, uh, I guess all almost all the way through 2020 now, and uh, not quite two years. And it's been a really really good. Two years. We had people start getting the Holy Ghost uh, the first week. Just right out of the gate. Yeah, 70 some people received the Holy Ghost the first year we were in that new building. And mm. this year uh, started off at a bang. Quite a few received the Holy Ghost in January and February. When COVID hit, we had to shut down for seven weeks. Uh, we baptized a few people to shut down, but it, it did. Uh, for a while, it, it, it stymied the flow of uh, conversions that we were seeing. But since we've open back up, things have been uh, popping pretty hot the last several weeks. I think we baptized six people last week and been having a number of people receive the Holy Ghost, and so good things are happening. And the visitor flow, we have never seen a visitor flow into our services like we have been seeing in the last few weeks. All these denominational churches are shut down still, yeah, and people are wanting to go to church. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, so our doors are open, and God be our helper. We don't intend to shut down again. Well, I think you were telling me that the streaming dynamic really played a role in touching the community, letting people know what you were about, seeing what God was doing there. I mean, they could see it right there on their iPad yes. or their laptop. Yeah, it's been a thing. You know, we've, uh, I guess like a lot of churches, we were somewhat backwards when it comes to uh, technology, and we had just never taken the uh, step to uh, stream our services, never saw it as being a great benefit or necessary. Yeah. And during the shutdown, it was something we had to do. We had to figure out how to do it. The first week of it, it was just a exercise in survival at the time. And we were overwhelmed during the few weeks that we were shut down at how many people in our community, people that don't go to church, uh, started viewing our services and listening to the preaching, and started getting feedback from it. And when we opened services back up, we just have continued to uh, live stream. And every single service, uh, we have a fairly large amount of people that uh, view the service uh, before the week is out. And uh, we have a lot of visitors that come to church as a direct result of us live streaming the service. So it has been a, a tremendous outreach for us. Yeah. Yeah, I can see. And you're going to have to you're going to have to do some some remodeling or something because I was there. We had some one life meetings. Yes. That you and pastor may and myself were, were pushing for and uh, providing for the area. And uh, it was back then. Yeah. And I mean like standing room only people standing around the back, you know, that was happening. It was a special event, but your church was pushing those boundaries. Well, now with this growth you're talking about, you're going to have to bust out walls or something already yeah. you're two years into your building. I, I know. We've already started making plans. We'll be meeting with a contractor next week to uh, knock out the back wall and my, uh, my. try to put another 120 seats or better into the sanctuary and just keep pushing forward. Well, God's going to do it. Yeah. He's going to do it. Well, I'm really excited about what you're doing here in Durham. And also, I'm excited about this podcast and, and Biblos. And I'm a little bit new to the world of podcasting, and uh, I thought it'd be good if you take a minute just to share with me uh, how Biblos come about, and, and what is it about? Well, um, what, we're, what we're striving for with Biblos is a way to effectively communicate biblical dynamics, and Biblos literally means the book. It means the book, and when I say the book, I mean the Bible. There, uh, um, Even among 
Jews and among Muslims, there's a commonality in that they will call us the people of the book. Oh, I like that. The people of the book. So Christianity is at a pivotal point. And publicly, there's probably a larger level of mistrust Mm -hmm. in terms of um, how people view some aspects of Christianity. And I think that's because it's been distorted. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten into a commercialization. We've gotten into a misguided profiteering uh, by people who claim to be one thing and maybe they don't really live that. So to be biblically centered, yes, to truly love the word of God, the logos, yes, and the rhema, the, the Greek terms that capture the essence of the book, that's what we're trying to do. And there's been a couple attempts that we've made. Um, we, we had another attempt where we were starting to put out some material under the banner of My Kingdom Living, and mm-hmm. um, we've done some stuff with Issachar. But this one was something I wanted to do here in Durham that would uh, be able to grab a hold of what I've always hoped to do and connect with like-minded people like yourself and others that have a passion for the Word of God. You love the Word of God. Bishop Godier here in Durham built this church on the Word of God as opposed to, and when I say that, I know people assume that, well, aren't all churches like that? And actually, the, the truth is a lot of churches, they can put the emphasis on music. Right, right kind of a music worship orientation, um, or they'll build a lot of connect points. That's kind of a buzzword today, connect point, connect this, connect that. And the idea is keep people busy, get people involved, and that's how your church can... Activity centers. Activity centers. And then um, kind of like a social goodness approach where, you know, we're going to... We're going to go out and we're going to give stuff away to people. And, and that's how you build a church. Well, I don't think those are the core of the church. And we do those things, and they're a part of what we do, but they're not the core. Um, the core is the Word. That's right. And it is the one thing that will never pass away that Jesus described. So there's a love for the Word. And when I say the Word, I mean the Scriptures, knowing the Scriptures, falling in love with His Word and Him the Lord, and understanding some of the Greek and the Hebrew dynamics and even some of the Latin that is behind it that brings us to why we do what we do, why we live how we live. Apostolic Pentecostals are some of the most unique people on the earth. Yes. And you're one and I'm one. And so a lot of people that are going to be listening to this are Apostolic Pentecostals, but some people are going to be tuning in and saying, who are these guys? Um, What is this all about? And so... I want to be able to give them a voice and be able to interview people and, and discuss some topics that are very relevant. So that's what I hope Biblos can be. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's tremendous. So if I'm understanding right, you, it's going to be yourself and other guests and just take biblical concepts and have frank discussions about our doctrine and to affirm the things that we believe and, and things that identify us as oneness Pentecostals. I think it's tremendous. Yeah. See, the fact that we're oneness is huge. Yes, in Christendom, there has been an antagonism between what they call Trinitarian thought and the Jewish communities and the Muslim communities mm-hmm. to the degree, to the point that um, Jewish and Muslim people throughout the centuries will outright reject what has been presented as Christianity because it's seen as polytheism. Yes. Like there's three people in heaven dialoguing and that is an abomination and they have a point yeah they have a point yeah so in the world of christianity oneness pentecostals stand out because we know that god is numerically one yes and that may not be a big deal to some folks they may not think it's a big deal but the bible says there's no greater commandment than hero israel the lord our god is one lord that's right and so for any of our muslim friends or our jewish friends that are tuning into this uh you know guys there are Christians who know that there's only numerically one God. And um, I hope that we can explore some of those dynamics and really create a strong apostolic oneness identity. It's tremendous. So, um, okay, well, there was a couple things I wanted to dive into in this session. And one of them was I can remember one of the first times I heard you really preach. And you, if I remember right, I think I wanted to say it was at a summit. 
and you preached a message on not seething a kid in its mother's milk. Oh, yes, I remember that message. Yeah. I think it was titled The Culture of Life. Culture of Life. It was an amazing message. And um, seed is an old English word for a cook or, yeah. or stew, and kid is a, in a small goat. Old English, for those that aren't familiar with the old English, uh, Shakespearean language. But basically, when you cook, and this is part of the law. This is part of... Yeah, the Mosaic law. Thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. Don't take what was intended to be a source of life and make it the instrument of death. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's a powerful concept. Well, So somebody's reading the Bible and they read that, they just go, well, that's a weird deal. That must be... Well, I don't even know what that means. And they just skip on past that. A Gentile would do that. A, a yeah. modern-day American would just kind of jump over that. But the principle. The principle. See, all of the Old Testament laws, well, we are not Jewish people, and we certainly don't live under the law of Moses. But the laws of Moses, even the ones that were ceremonial, all of them had underlying principles, principles of godliness that I believe are eternal principles. And so the application of the principle was a certain way under the uh, covenant of the law of Moses, but here we are in the dispensation of grace, the principles of godliness that underwrote the law, if I could say it that way, those still exist. And the principle of not boiling the baby in its mother's milk, there's a principle there that's one that has application for the church. And I've tried over the years to just ponder that and tried to take that principle as I see it and to apply it into the culture of the church that I pastor in Memphis. Yeah, and, and the the reason why I bring that up is because it was very impacting for a lot of people. You dealt with some topics that people have grappled with and wrestled with and have been very divisive in the Pentecostal world. Sure. I guess some people would refer to people who love the Bible and who really follow the Bible. They might call them fundamentalists. Yeah. Um, that might be a secular term. But in within the culture that we live in, you might call it conservative or liberal, or we would probably refer to the term holiness. Sure. Uh, holiness, separate people. And sometimes the term uh, legalist is used to uh, describe us as well. A negative, disparaging it's term. Disparaging, and I believe it's incorrect, but it is used. Yeah. So... I want to talk a little bit about that because I think there's a lot of apostolics that want to know what the difference is. Is it a big deal? How are we going to have church? Um, so apostolics are pretty unique in that, yes, we believe in numerically one God, but we also believe in holiness. Yes. Holiness and separation. And if you were just walking down the street and you see an apostolic, uh, a lot of times an apostolic woman You'll see a woman with uncut hair. You'll see a woman dress modestly. I mean, she covers her body. You'll see her in a dress. Yes. Because um, Scripture teaches this, and people don't know why. You know, there's a lot of people who claim Christianity that, sure. that don't do that. They don't feel like that's a big deal. But apostolics, we do. And um, I can remember one of the times this really hit me. It was actually you and I were with a group of preachers, and we went to Israel. I remember that. It yeah. was a good time in Israel. Had a good time. And while we were there, I saw something I had never seen. I'm used to living here in the United States. And when you live in the United States, you can live kind of in a secular bubble. Right. Western Europe and the United States, we think that's how life is. Well, there's a big world out there with very different cultural leanings and teachings. And so they're not secularized. They're not westernized. They're not inundated with Hollywood and and all of the stuff that is really rotting yeah. Western culture away. So here we are. We're in Israel. I want to say we might have even been in Jerusalem. And my wife and I, we were out walking around getting a coffee or something. And a bell rang. And a door flung open. It was a door to a school. And out of that school poured all of these young ladies. They were schoolgirls. I don't know, 13, 14, 15, 16, mid-teens. 
they come running out and they come running by us. And it was one of the most amazing things because every one of them had uncut hair. They were wearing dresses. They were dressed modestly. And it looked like a bunch of apostolics just came running yeah, by. Yeah. And I looked at my wife and here she is. She is, her hair is not cut. She is dressed modestly. And I'm looking at this and I'm, it was weird because I've never been in the majority before. It's all, it's yeah, all, it's yeah. always been like, yeah, you know, we're, we're those folks that are different than we look a little different than the people around us. Yeah. But the Jewish, this comes from Jewish teachings and fundamentals. Holiness does. And that's a big deal. Yes. And it's still a big deal to a, a, a large branch of Judaism today. Yeah. Yeah. So in that world, we are holiness people. And some might say that if you teach holiness and you hold to holiness and you love the word of God, that you might be backwards, that you might be um, old fashioned and, and that your church can't grow. Right. People, people think that. Right. Common, common perceptions. Yeah. But that's not what I've experienced. That's not what you're experiencing. No, not at all. We, we, we started the church in Fort Myers. We started uh, and built a church in Roatan, Honduras. We pastored in South Haven. And here at Durham, we're exploding with growth. Um, we're having to contemplate building a new facility or, or something of that nature here in Durham. You guys are having to do that. Um, now, how in the world can we preach holiness like we're describing and still grow? Yeah, that's a, that's a tremendous question. You know, a lot of people, as you mentioned, view holiness teaching, in particular our positions on separation from the world and things we teach that we would call holiness standards. Uh, many people view those as prohibitive of growth. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. And Granted, some people, we have to admit our, our failures as a movement, there have been a handful of leaders in the broader apostolic movement that have presented our position in a uh, mean-spirited way or or done it in a ignorant fashion. And so we have to admit that. But we have to also admit that that is not the majority. The people that are mean-spirited and unkind regarding uh, any of our positions on holiness, those are so far in the minority. You meet you, you take a random sample of an apostolic pastor that loves the Word of God, you're going to find out they very much love the Bible, they love God, and they love people. They love people. And they're very sincere yeah. in the things of God. So to portray teaching on holiness as being mean-spirited and contrary to growth is not a real, true, or honest uh, argument. And it's just my thought that it's hard to have real, sustained authentic growth without having a lifestyle of holiness and separation and consecration unto the Lord. These are biblical principles, and they're principles if that we embrace them correctly, they bring life into a church. Yeah. So to ignore holiness is to ignore large swaths of the Bible. Yes. To act like it's not there. First Timothy uh, 2, 1 Peter 3, yes. Isaiah 3. Um, all of these dynamic and, and many parents and grandparents followed holiness in the apostolic Pentecostal world, but a misguided dynamic in our world today, our, our digital world, our entertainment influence world is a lot of apostolic young adults and um, even just regular folks of all walks of life and ages they, they throw away a lot of those principles to try to lessen um, criticism yes, and fit in and maybe a misguided attempt to grow. Maybe if the thinking is, if we're not so strict, maybe we can grow. But nothing we do is built by force or coercion or exploitation. And if that is being done, then that's not of God. That's right. And so that's kind of what you were saying. Don't seethe a kid in its mother's milk. The gospel was exactly. not given to kill. It was given to give life. Right. And in particular, when it comes to the subject of holiness standards with separation, this doctrine is a blessing to us. 
And I think it's important as ministers that when we are preaching and teaching the people in our congregations about the principles of holiness, that we do it in from the prism of blessing. Everything that God gave us in his word is there for our benefit. It's not there to harm us. God is not an austere, utilitarian uh, being up in the sky that's just trying to invent ways to constrict our lives and make us more miserable. God wants us to live and to flourish. That's what it's about. And I feel like that holiness standards, when they're properly approached and when they're taught from the right paradigm, that they inject a tremendous amount of spiritual life into a congregation. But when we teach them with a lack of revelation, we come at them with a defensive posture. It's us against the world, and we, if, if we present them in a way that's legalistic or mean-spirited, then we're violating the law that said don't boil the kid in its mother's milk. We're taking what should be an instrument of life and using it as something that can bring destruction to people. Yeah. That's such a powerful principle to grab a hold of that. God's love. God is love. Yes. That is his nature. Not willing that any should perish. So to approach it from a legalistic or a dogmatic or an aggressive um, isolationist perspective, that's a common misperception. And yes. We'll talk a little bit about that. But that's not what we've done. Many times you would come into our, I know in my church that I've pastored and in your church, when you come into our church, you're going to see people from all walks of life. All walks of life, all oh, stages. They're coming from every everywhere. And the the emphasis is peace and joy and love and authentic connection. I, I actually read something, um, uh, I forget how long ago it was, a couple months maybe, maybe a year ago maybe. Anyway, I was reading about some a movement among entertainers and among Hollywood elites, kind of a woke kind of a dynamic where several of the women were becoming empowered, kind of like a Me Too kind of a deal. Mm -hmm. And one of and they they were talk, talking about how they were empowered, all the ways they were going to be empowered. And one of the ways was that they weren't going to wear makeup. Oh wow. I mean, they literally, they washed their face and they went makeup free. How neat. And they were saying how that empowered them. And I, I immediately might, I looked at it and I thought, wow, now that's, that's pretty interesting. Because here, I, I want to say it was like Alicia Keys or somebody like that. got very criticized because she dared to wash the makeup off her face. Well, and she just shot right back and said something to the effect um, of, I'm okay how God made me. Oh, wow. Good for her. Yeah. Well, I, and I'm beautiful how God made me. Why do I have to objectify myself? Why do I have to sensualize myself? And I'm empowered when I do this. Now, okay, now that's, I don't know if she had the Bible that was guiding her on that, but the Bible's taught that for oh, yeah. thousands of years. And apostolic women and, and men have known that we're not supposed to do that. The Bible teaches not to do that. We don't. We choose not to do that because of that. And we've endured a lot of criticism over that. We have a lot. Yeah, but if you take a woman who is being forced into an over-sexualized, over-sensualized society, and you have got to, and I, I know it can be portrayed as beauty, uh, a distortion of beauty, but if if you have to paint yourself for a man to know your value, I think. That's wrong. And I, I have found that this is seen when people do it with very young girls. They'll take a, a little girl that's eight, nine, ten years old, and they'll, they'll really uh, paint her. And when she comes out, she looks like she's, she's 25. Yeah, yeah. And it's a travesty what they're doing, uh, putting that kind of pressure to conform. And to, they're basically saying that you know, they're objectifying. Yeah, you're not good enough like you are. <clears throat> yeah. Something's got to be different. We need a material product to improve uh, who you are as a person. Yeah. I heard one preacher, a little girl came up and asked him and said, um, Bishop, why, why, don't, why don't we paint ourselves? And he just got down on one knee and he said, well, sweetheart, we, 
we don't paint ourselves for the same reason God doesn't paint flowers. That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. If, if we're building our lives on something that shallow, and we think that that is the definition of, I think beauty is a lot deeper than that. Yes. And I think our world needs grace. They need patience. They need love. They need kindness. We are in desperate need of kindness in our world we're living in. So that's beauty. It's, it's, and, and then yes, that doesn't mean we don't take care of ourselves and whatnot, but, but true apostolic people have known this for centuries and millennia. So it's not about, you know, we can't do this. We can't do that. We choose not to out of a love for the word, right? And the word of God. So to take that kind of a mindset and then people to embrace it. So, the, I mean, you know that there was a time in American history when uh, men and women embraced modesty as part of Christianity. Yes, and gender, gender appropriate apparel too. Yeah. Well, that's a big deal right there. It's a big deal. Yeah. And, and you know, Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians when he's talking about hair, long hair on women and short hair on men, he makes a statement. He said, doth not even nature itself teach you? And I think there's a lot of things regarding holiness living. If, if, we're, if we're full of the Holy Ghost, we don't even need the Bible to totally teach us that. Obviously, we need the Bible, but, <clears throat> but nature lays a foundation for these teachings. Yeah. Nature teaches us that a man should look and act like a man, dress like a man, and nature teaches us that a woman should look and dress like a woman. And then, of course, the Bible is reaffirming what nature is already teaching us. Okay, so we're talking about this from a positive dynamic. Yes. There are people who will take that and make it a list of rules and will hurt people with it. Right, that's legalism. That's legalism for Phariseeism and a bunch of, it makes it a list. It reduces a heavenly principle that protects people and provides a, a very positive atmosphere. And it, it reduces it to just a bunch of stuff you do. Yeah, it reduces it to action and then it becomes performance-based religion. And underlying that approach to holiness is that we are saved or lost based on what we are doing instead of us being in Christ. Scripturally, when we're born again, when we're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, we are placed in Christ. And we have a righteousness that is not our own righteousness. It's imputed righteousness. And so we stand in his righteousness and we are accepted. Uh, I read one scripture just the other day that said he made us accepted in the beloved. In the beloved. Yeah. So we're not accepted based on what we do, we're accepted based on our position. In Christ. And when I'm in Christ and I embrace my position in Christ, then a godly lifestyle is an outflow of who I am. A godly lifestyle is not achieved by taking an arbitrary list of rules, even biblical rules, putting them on the wall, and then me trying to live up to them. That was the problem in the Old Testament with the law. Paul said in Romans that the law was weak through the flesh. It wasn't that the law was weak, but the breakdown of the whole system of the law was the flesh was never able to rise up to the standard that the law set. And the only way we can satisfy God's righteous standards is by being filled with the Spirit and having the imputed righteousness of Christ and having that new nature. And out of the new nature comes new behavior. And so when we teach uh, holiness standards, those teachings need to just simply be directing and shaping and informing the new nature and the new behavior we have. They are not a means to obtain a new nature and, and to in and of themselves produce new behavior. That, that's an inward work of the Spirit. Yeah. But the legalist doesn't understand that. Legalist thinks it's all about rules and Typically, people that approach holiness standard from that standpoint, 
they have no personal revelation of the underlying principles of holiness. And sometimes they're making a good faith effort to teach holiness standards and to produce righteousness and separation in the congregation. But because they're, they're doing it backwards, they're, they get the rule, they get the application first, but not much more than the application, and they never get the principle behind the application, it produces a lot of self-righteousness. And anytime you have a church that's full of self-righteousness, you have a lot of unrighteousness. Yeah, filthy rags. Yeah, exactly. So that's the milk of the Word of God being used to, to boil people. Yes. You are, you are doing violence to a life-giving nature. So the culture changes. It becomes a culture of death. Yes. So what should have been giving nourishment, what should have been helping people grow and mature and uh, become what God intended them to be, it becomes an instrument of death. Yes. So yeah, it's a bunch of rules. It's a bunch of um, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, don't do this, can't do that. We're watching you. Uh, we're better than everybody else outside. Um we have, and, and churches like that tend to be very small. They tend to um, be authoritarian. They tend to be very abusive in how they approach holiness. And that's not, God never intended for that to happen. God didn't intend for it to happen. It's not godly at all. Mm -mm. And that's not true holiness. No, it's not. So a number of years ago, I, I, got, I got a glimpse of what real, true, uh, genuine holiness looks like just through watching the life of my bishop, Joel Holmes, and watching the way he conducted himself, watching his prayer life, and, and just the sweet, wonderful attitude in which he presented standards of holiness. Now, for all the people that know Bishop Holmes, he has always preached a very strong standard of holiness in, in the broader spectrum of the apostolic Pentecostal movement. Definitely... Uh, more on the right side and amongst the conservatives, and I still embrace and teach every single thing he ever taught, and so preach it, and believe it, and love every bit of it. But what I watched about Pastor Holmes is when he would preach or teach on a holiness-related issue, he did it in such a sweet and wonderful way. It just made you want to live for God. It made you want to fall in love with it, and so I was I've started pastoring the church a number of years ago, and, and when I've approached that, I don't know that I do a good job at presenting it like Pastor Holmes do, does, but that was always my intention. Every time I get in the pulpit to talk about it, and I think we need to talk about holiness and talk about it often. I believe standards need to be taught and preached on a regular basis. I, am, I do not subscribe to the people that say that they're a barrier to growth or they run people off. I think they draw people in when they're presented correctly. And so I'm a huge advocate for a pastor, first of all, getting a revelation of what you believe, yeah. what's the Word of God teach, and then approach that pulpit in such an anointed, dynamic, sweet, loving way. And when holiness is presented, people that are in that congregation that are sincerely in love with God, they're going to love the Word of God. They're going to and, love it. And they're going to love the teaching of holiness, and it's going to bring a blessing. Yeah. And we've just got to put it out to people in a way that we're showing them that this will lead you into a dimension of blessing from the Lord. And it's, a, it's a key to a church taking dominion in their city as well. Yeah. Yeah, you, you've you been talking about that. I'm going to ask you about that in a second. But before we dive into that, I want to say that... On one side, you can have people who are overly legalistic who yes. make it a list of rules. Okay, there's another side, too, that you can swing the pendulum the other way, and you can say there's no lifestyle changes if when you come to God. Um, there's nothing you need to do. It's all in my heart. It doesn't matter how I conduct myself. It doesn't matter where I go. It doesn't matter how I dress. None of that. God doesn't care about any of that. And you can swing the pendulum the other way. Right. And a lot of people that get hurt by legalism will swing the other way. That's right. They'll use the legalism as a justification and they'll say, well, they hurt me. So they're all wrong. All churches are wrong. All people in church are evil. I'm going to go out and I'm going to be a little heathen. And right. 
live like the devil. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's a problem in Christianity because you have guys that are trying so hard to relate to society that they become society. That's right. There's no, there's no line. There's no difference between God's people and secular society, which the world, which is the term for secular society, it's a, it's a lifestyle without God. Right. It's where God does not govern our actions. God does not inform us on a day-to-day basis. We don't need God. It's a humanist dynamic. It's a sinful dynamic. Just do what you want, however you want, live life however you want to. And the divorce and the, the poverty and the chaos and um, what we see just boiling over in American society quite a bit. Right. Um, it's all a byproduct of refuting the word of God and acting like it's not necessary, not setting parameters, not beginning to apply biblical principles in our life. So um, people are leaving a lot of mainstream churches and, and a lot of Pentecostal churches and apostolic churches who in a misguided attempt to try to relate, they'll say, you guys aren't relevant anymore. You're, you're, you're old fashioned. We're, we're going to do it a different way. We're going to change things. And in doing that, they become so much like the world, so much like secular society that their kids just walk away. They become apathetic. Right. They want to, they just want to party and drink and, and just live. However, throw out the word of God, throw out a love for the word of God. They fall in love with entertainment. They fall in love with the ideologies that drive the regular populace. That's part of why we want to do Biblos is to just provide clarity on some stuff to help people Identify who I am. You know, if you're going to be a Christian, be a Christian. Yes. Live Let's like do it a all Christian. the way. Do it all the way. Because half stepping, half halfway serving God is, it doesn't work. It doesn't right. work. So on the other extreme, you have people who throw it all away. Well, within one or two generations, they don't even go to church anymore. They don't serve God. They don't love God. Or if they do, it's a very token, marginal, lukewarm application. Nothing like what they, or maybe their grandparents used to be. Right. Right. So that's kind of the, the two sides. Yeah, you know, you know it's a, and, and both sides have the exact same problem. It's carnality mm, that's and a lack point. of revelation. That's a good point. When you have carnality and lack of revelation, you'll go to extremes on one side or the other. And, and there are, are very real extremes, and holiness people are not extremist people. Biblically based people are not extremists. We might be labeled that by some, but we're not. Yeah. Okay. So here's an interesting point. Everybody has lines. Yes. So to to throw out all lines, you know, when when they when they reject God's lines and God's ways, they say, "Well, we don't need that." So they choose things arbitrarily based on their own human reasoning rather than the Bible. Right. Okay, so I don't need to wear that. I don't need to live like that. I don't need to. I can do this in my life. It's not a big deal. You're majoring on minors. You're just restricting my freedoms. Okay, when a person begins to do that, they drop the lines that God established. Well, what they usually find, and this is something I've seen, is that their kids will go further. Yes, and then grandkids go further. And so finally one day these little these little uh, Martians walk in. <laughs> They're your yeah. grandkids and you're like, "Oh my goodness, how, uh, wh- you can't you can't wear that. You can't that, that's indecent." And they look at mom and dad, grandma and grandpa and they go, "What do you mean?" Yeah. You did. This is where I draw the line. I think this is modest. Yeah. And you've opened up Pandora's box because you've made it all subjective and you've forsaken the way of, of the word. Right. Yeah. We all need lines. The, and the Bible's Bible's full of lines. The Bible's full of boundaries and we need to be okay with that. Boundaries aren't bad. <laughs> you need to write a book. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to be writing books. I know we've talked about a few of them. Um, okay. Now let's talk a little bit. I, I, one of the things that frustrates me, is the caricatures that people on both sides of the equation lob at each other. Right. So, in, and we'll just talk about Pentecost right now. 
in the Pentecostal world, there is a caricature that if you believe holiness, and you are a conservative apostolic preacher, that you are ignorant, that you browbeat people, that um, you're mean, that you're judging people. Yes. Because they'll, they'll take a group, a fringe group, where that does happen, and they will then take that and caricaturize every right. conservative preacher that way and every conservative church that way. Right, to, to take the exception and use it to divine the whole. Yeah, that, that's... You hurt people that way. Yeah. And you miss out on a lot of good friends that way, too. Yeah. Okay, but the, other, the same thing happens on the other side. Conservatives can take the most extreme liberal example. I mean, just live however they want to live, do whatever they want to do, live wild and completely contrary to the Word of God, and still say, I'm a Christian. And they'll say, oh, see, there they are. Every single person who doesn't live like I do, you're going to wind up just like that. Yeah, you're liberal or or common saying I've heard is they don't even believe that fat meat is greasy. <laughs> <laughs> I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Yeah. That's a Pentecostal saying. Yeah. So <clears throat> that's caricaturization. Yeah. And you know, like when um in political cartoons they do it. They'll take one feature about a politician or a famous person, like uh, I think like a big red hair dude that's just massive. Yeah. I think it, like when George uh, W. Bush was president, I think it was his nose. Yeah. Like he had these big ears and he had this yeah. big nose. And they would, these humongous ears and yeah. nose on. And that's how you knew who, little squinty eyes. <laughs> and um, they would caricaturize him in the paper. And they're making fun and they're, they're accentuating a feature. Yes. And it's obviously not accurate. Well, yeah. that's what people do with conservatives and liberals. They... Like, uh, there's a lot of people that think that I don't wear colored shirts. Oh, wow. And that I have to wear my shirts down uh, below my fingertips to be holy. Well, everybody's got different lines, and they have different ways of doing things. Um, but, you know, we're not, there's not a, it's not an ignorant dynamic. We believe in education. Very much so. Very much so. We need to be educated. We believe in entrepreneurship. We believe in absolute liberty in the kingdom of God, just within the confines of the Bible. Right. Um, so I find it very frustrating when they, when they do that, they put people in a box and then lump them all in there. Yeah. It's not right. And it's, it's, it's really dishonest in many cases. And there's so many, uh, there's so many factors that comes into labeling. Uh, it'd be good. Probably have a whole discussion just on labeling sometime, but, there's typically a lot of pride and ego coming from the one that's doing the labeling. We, uh, we put ourselves in a position of superiority when we do that. For me to label you as either um, uh, an extremist or, or liberal, very subtly, in many cases, I'm placing myself, what is unspoken is that I'm right. And you're wrong, and you would be okay if you was like me. Yeah. And so we have to be very careful about that. Paul said it this way in one of his writings. He said that if we compare ourselves amongst ourselves, we are not wise. Not wise. Really, instead of comparing ourselves to the liberal across town or the extremists that we know, it's better for us to compare ourselves with the Word of God. Yeah. And what does the Bible say? When... I start looking at all of what the Bible teaches and how I really am. I realize I still got a lot to live up to. And it kind of knocks the wind out of my sails when it comes to uh, wanting to critique everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. When, when you take a position of humility and love, then people grow into holiness. Right. You know, it's not, you don't, I don't teach people holiness before they know how, before they have the Holy Ghost. You can't be holy without the Holy Ghost. Right. And a prayerful life where you crucify the flesh and you resist your base human nature and you overcome your own 
wickedness within by the power of Jesus Christ. You walk in his righteousness on a daily basis. You don't want to you don't want to live just any way. You want to live according to the word of the Lord. Right. And the peace that comes out of that, the the strong marriages that come out of that, the godly children that come out of that, the the heritage, the legacy that comes out of that are those are powerful dynamics that you unleash when you do that. Right. So how in the world can we preach holiness and follow this like the scripture teaches and still grow? Um, I want to dive into that here in just a minute, but before we do, we were talking a little bit about, um, was it Roger Bork or Robert Bork? Robert Bork. Robert Bork. Okay. Yeah. So he wrote the book slouching towards Gomorrah. Yes. Powerful and, book. I mean, and it's one of the reasons that highlights pretty well why we don't move off of God's word. Like we, that's right. We don't want to move off of positions we've made in holiness because if we do, we begin to move towards society. Right. So it creates, if we have Abraham on one side of the spectrum, on the other side, we have Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are some metaphors people can readily identify with. If those are the two sides of the spectrum, we want to stay away from Sodom and Gomorrah as much as we can. Exactly. We don't want to live like that. We don't want that lifestyle. We don't want the chaos and the pain and the addiction and all of the, the terrible things. And in Sodom and Gomorrah, Egypt, Babylon, the Bible has a lot of metaphors for right. sinful right. places. Figurative cities. Yes. Well, when people begin to play around with holiness and begin to forsake holiness and try to relate or try to, you know, if you'll, if you'll come to church, then this isn't really that big a deal. When they start doing that, they start slouching towards Gomorrah. Yeah. The Bible says that Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Yeah. Before he ever got to Sodom. Yeah. And so he's leaning that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a big deal. Because when a church does that, they're closer to Sodom and Gomorrah than what their fathers were. Right. Or the grandfathers were. Right. So we're seeing the decline of Christianity here in the United States, or what is called Christianity, because people let down on this back in the 60s and 70s and to try to get a bigger mass appeal and to commercialize the gospel. They said, you don't need to be modest. You don't need to make uh, humility a priority. Right. Um, and then pride came in and vanity and, and all the works of the flesh started coming in. Well, you inch closer and closer and closer until like Lot, one day you wake up and you're in it. That's right. And the irony is... You, we can only surmise what Lot was thinking when he went to Sodom, but Sodom probably offered more appearance of prosperity. Lot somehow fought. Well-watered plains. Well-watered plains. I'll be better off if I go there, but he stuck around Uncle Abraham and hitched on to some of that blessing that God was going to let flow through Abraham. He would have ended his life with so much more abundance that anything he could have gotten in Sodom by any means, even if Sodom had not been destroyed, Lot would have never prospered in Sodom as much as what he would have prospered as he stuck with Abraham and uh, been a recipient of the blessing that God gave to Abraham and his family. Okay, so Lot thinks that he's going to get blessing by going down into Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's yes. a common theme. Yes. Um, I'm going to do better. I don't need this. That's a bunch of man-made rules. I don't need to live like Abraham. I don't need to um, live according to his ways. And metaphorically, that's you know the church. That's what people consider to be old-fashioned ways of living. Yes. So in that, he thinks he's going to find wealth. He's going to find what he's looking for. He gets down in there, and he loses everything. He loses his walk with God. He loses his family. He loses so much. And um, it's all because if he had remained with Abraham and the promises of Abraham, the dominion and the blessing of Abraham, that he could have had it all. He, he could, have, could have had it all. And you know, the, the thing that's important to understand that root 
of compromise usually is distilled down to two things. It's pride and greed. And I think that's why uh, we're warned in the New Testament, the book of Jude, to not go after the error of Balaam, who for re- for the hope of getting a reward, changed the message or tried to change the message that God gave him. And then uh, when Paul gave the qualifications of a bishop, one of the qualifications is this man cannot be greedy, a filthy lucre. Because you have an apostolic church leader who is in love with money, you're going to get compromise, mm. and you're going to get a bunch of false doctrine every single time. Yeah, so I'm getting pressured because if I don't give what this guy wants that has a lot of money, or if I make people mad, or if I right. preach something controversial, which the gospel is controversial. It is. The very essence of it is confrontational, and it's controversial. Okay, so there's a scripture that the Bible teaches that when a person enters into this mindset, that the offense of the cross ceases. Yes. And Paul said this in one place. He said, um, they've become enemies of the cross of Christ. It didn't say they were enemies of Jesus Christ. It said they were enemies of the cross. And so part of holiness is living a crucified life. Yes. Where you die to yourself. You die to your your selfishness, your pettiness, your carnal, uh, sinful human nature. And you take up your cross, you follow Jesus Christ, you deny yourself. Right. And in doing so, you'll receive a life that you could never imagine. That's right. So the way of the cross is really the way of blessing. Just like in Lot's day, wow, the, the path to Abraham was taken, even though it was the path less traveled, and it didn't look as glamorous on the front end. It was the best path, and it was the most blessed path. Yeah. And I just think conservative apostolic people need to get that same revelation. We're on a good path right now. I think everybody needs that revelation. Yeah. I've been in cities before where there's guys that will not embrace this, or they have stepped away from what their grandparents taught, what their parents taught. You know, that puts elder saints in a tough spot. It sure does. Man, I, I, I know that things can be kind of old fashioned. You know, um, I've been in church services before where we sing those old hymns. Once like a bird in prison, I dwelt no freedom from my sorrow. I felt you know just old hymns that people maybe yeah it's not good today. But when you have lived a life of consecration and church has been a certain way, and then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're living in a digital world, everything is neon, everything is digitized. You can't worship expressively. You 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 change everything. Elder saints of God have no frame of reference. No, they have no frame of reference, and, and they're almost trapped when they're in those kind of situations. Yeah. Yeah, and then you get a guy who doesn't know the Bible or, or doesn't have a grasp on it, and he slowly takes them out of an authentic apostolic environment. Well, then it becomes, hey, I want to be more like these people. I want to, I want to start, if I can use the term secular Christianity. If I, if I can start to embrace this, I want to go and learn this. I think we're backwards. I think we're, you know, when you get fallen with that mindset, you are no longer an apostolic church, right? You're functioning as a mainstream evangelical, you know, run of the mill church. Yeah. And people trade, it's, it's amazing how cheap they sell out. They trade the glory of God for something that's not glory at all. We have a, we have a, um, non-denominational church in the Memphis area. It's one of the larger churches. I haven't ever been to a service, but we have won a number of people to God who were members there. And I've seen a lot of pictures and I've been in the building. But when they have church, the lights are turned off and it's all the colored LED lights and it's got the atmosphere of a concert. It looks like, from looking at the pictures, it looks like you're going to a club of some sort. And one of the things that one young adult right after another has told us when they come into our church, they said, one of the things that we like about your church is that the lights are on. That That's interesting. They said, we don't like the colored lights. Said, really, to be honest with you, we always felt like we were just going to another version of the club at the other church. And when I see apostolic people doing the same thing, you see the pictures, it's the dark sanctuaries and the LED lights. And we have LED lights at our church, but we just keep the lights on. Yeah, But I think the point is, and I know that 
that statement could be a nitpick because I don't think God cares what color the lights are and God made lights, yada, yada. But <laughs> it's uh, we got to be careful that we don't try to assimilate an atmosphere from what we see as the ultra-progressive denominational churches and think that produces life and results in the congregation or growth. It does not. No. We need an authentic move of the Holy Ghost. Righteous, holiness, preaching, worship, throw down church, shouting, running, dancing. Uh, that's what uh, that's what brings life to a church. That's what brings growth. The bottom line is those kind of churches, most of them aren't growing either. They have an illusion of growth. And you have a handful of churches that are mega churches that have all the trappings of success, but the run-of-the-mill church that's going that way, they aren't producing a crowd either. No. By and large, the average church is falling by the wayside. It is. Church buildings are emptying. Clergy are leaving because there's no hope. Um, an increasingly secularized society, they're, they're dying on the vine. Right. So um, I, I was in Manhattan one time, and we I took a group up there, and we were uh, walking around the city, and, and one of the young men, we went out to a large denominal church. And when we went in, it was um, it was a production. They the psychology behind it was pretty amazing. They had every demographic represented on the worship team. So there was a white guy, a couple white guys, there was a couple black guys, an Asian guy, Hispanic guy, and it was a demographic appropriate yeah. um, presentation. They were all very photogenic, um, like they went to a, a, a roll call of some kind and picked people out based on how many yeah. hours they'd been in the gym. And I'm all for going to the gym and exercising and keep taking care, but it was such a choreography and the strobe lights. There were no seats in the in the sanctuary. Everybody was no mo- seats. No seats. Wow. Milling around, talking, laughing. You know, it was a club. It was a club with Christian music, and um, the presence of God was not there. It was not holy. Um, the pastor of the church, you know, he's seen frequently in. Um, publications and on the internet he's got his shirt off and he's hanging around with celebrities wow. okay so to to take the holy and to reduce it to that i mean if you're gonna go to a club go to a club if you're gonna go to church people want to go to church that's right they want the presence of god they want to they want to feel that that presence of god 